all is vanity. Life under the sun, when you look at it, when it's all said and done, it doesn't profit you anything. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't some um, lessons to learn to have live life wisely on this earth. And, of course, next uh, week we'll finish where he says, when it's all heard and said and done, this is the conclusion, fear God. Because one day you will leave this life on the earth and you will stand before God and give an account. So use that as the overarching, overriding uh, uh, perspective and then you're going to have a good life on this earth. But he gives some very interesting principles here in chapter 11. It's probably one of my favorite chapters of all of them. Well, as you'll see, it's just because it just gives you some uh, principles to, to live life by, to grasp life. And people call it all sorts of things. You know, no risk, no reward. Life is uncertain. Embrace it. But we're going to see it. It's just that... Just go after life because it is short. You are going to die. Isn't that the principle we saw over and over and over? And so live every day. What is, was that the Tim McGraw song? Live every day as though you're dying. Yeah. Well, if he got that from anywhere, he got it from, you know, Ecclesiastes or taking the same kind of thoughts that Solomon did, that life is short and pretty soon you're going to die. So live each day to its fullest. So we're going to look at, we'll look at the first two verses and we'll make some sense of it. And then we'll just build on that. He says, cast your bread, verse 1, on the surface of the waters, for you will find it after many days. Divide your portion to seven or even to eight, for you do not know what misfortune may occur on the earth. Now, when you look, look at this, he said, why would you throw good bread on the water? It's not going to return to you. It's just going to get moldy and soggy and wet, all right? Well, that's really not what he's talking about. It's just throwing bread out on the water. He's talking about diversifying and doing everything that comes along and not just putting all your eggs in one basket. Was Solomon a great trader when it comes to economic resources and all that? Yes, he was an international player. He was rich, rich, rich. And people always traded with the, uh, Jerusalem. And so when you think about casting your bread on the water, think about... Well, food and grain, and you're shipping it to different places to trade and get things back. So would you put all your grain on one ship and all your investments, all your livelihood on one ship going to one destination? Why wouldn't you do that? It could sink. Pirates could confiscate. Did that happen? All right. So lots of misfortune could happen. Then what happens to all your investments? You're broke then. And so Solomon learned this, and he realized, he says, cast your bread on the surface of the waters. Um, sometimes the, the seas or the waters speaks of the nations of the people. But spread it out, and you're going to find it's going to come back to you. And he said, well, how do you know that he's talking about diversifying your activities? Because the verse 2 really explains it. Divide your portion to seven or even to eight. Because you don't know what misfortune may occur on the earth. The word misfortune could mean evil. You don't know what's going to happen. And so if you go to a, an investment counselor, what would they say to do with your portfolio? Diversify. Don't put everything in one basket. How about if someone comes along with a quick, a get-rich-quick scheme, but it's going to take pretty much all your investment? Run! <laughs> Don't do it, because they seldom, if ever, 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 ever work, okay? And so this idea of seven to eight is interesting. Uh, I, one man wrote that this phrase seven or even eight is an Old Testament pattern of X plus one. It's like, okay, uh, seven, is there a, a, anything peculiar about the number seven in the Old Testament especially? Perfect, complete. Uh, in six days, God created the heaven, earth, and the seventh day, he rested. We have seven days in a week. You know, there's seven times ten. There's so many multiples of seven in the Bible. Uh, the number four is the four directions of the earth, right? North, east, west, south, and north, east, south, and west. All right? Okay. <laughs> and then you add to that... The God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, four plus three is 
Twelve, seven. Yeah, it's just uh, it's interesting. Uh, um, they were in captivity seventy years, seven times ten. You know, and so ten is a anyway. Seven. Make sure you diversify. Do as many things you can, and then even what? Add add another. Just don't ever stop short, and just. Whenever opportunities come by, just take advantage of it. And again, he says the reason is because you do not know. Now, what's one overarching principle that you learn in the book of Ecclesiastes? You don't know what's going to happen. God has set uh, eternity in your heart, and just as you think you got things figured out, he's going to throw you a curveball, right? You don't know. This phrase is going to be used four times in this chapter alone. He's going to talk about the wind, about a tree, and about how uh, bones are formed in a womb. What do we know for certainty that's going to happen tomorrow? tomorrow? Nothing. Nothing. You do not know. Say, so, well, I'm going to put everything on this ship, I'm going to send it to Egypt, and I'm going to get rich, rich, rich. And so a storm comes up, unexpected, and there it goes. So you, all your fortunes are gone. Now, could it turn out? Well, yes, but the thing is what? You don't know. And so, what? That don't count on it. And so, try every avenue and everything that, that becomes available to you. And that's really what he's talking about here. And they say, well, I'm not going to be trading in ships and sh uh, doing international commerce. But can this filter down to your own life? Well, of course, Absolutely financially, it's relationships and everything you do. And that's what we're going to see here. He's going to talk about. Notice uh, this idea of you don't know. If the clouds are full, they pour out rain upon the earth. No, is that true? You go, huh, it's going to rain. Uh, I saw Lorraine yesterday, and John and Lorraine, she says, yeah, God lets me know about two or three days before it rains. I said, oh, really, your bones ache? No, the, the ligaments and all that. So did anyone else have that problem when the humidity change, the barometer goes down, whatever? You know, oh, it's going to rain, all right? Well, you don't have to have achy bones. You can just look at the clouds when they're full. Well, let me just ask you this. When will it rain when clouds are coming? When they're full. And if they're not full, will it rain? Basically not, all right? And so when they're full, they're going to rain. Do you know when they're going to be full enough to rain? Now, who does? God does. But that's a truism. There's some general orders or patterns in life that you can pretty much count on. Now, whether a tree falls towards the south or towards the north, wherever the tree falls, there it lies. Now, what's he saying? Here's a big tree, and it's standing. The wind blows. Which way is it going to fall? You don't know. Now, can you look at the lean, and here's the wind coming from this place, and it's, rod it's probably going to fall that way. But does it always go according to plan? No, if anyone that's fallen enough trees, you have to be very, very leery or else you get yourself killed because it'll usually go the opposite way that you want. I dropped some big cottonwoods or had a guy, Glenn's friend, 70-year-old <laughs> man. He worked in the, as a uh, feller in the trees, uh, in the woods. And he said, yeah, we'll drop this one right across the road in that field. And so I backed off and it's, you know, a big tree around this. He's sawing away. This is the first tree, right? And he looks like a woodsman. And it starts moving, and oh, no, it's coming right at me. And it's supposed to go that way. It's coming at me. It falls across the bridge, almost wipes my bridge out, across the pond, breaks a big tree, and he goes, oops, that didn't go where I wanted it to go. <laughs> oh, thanks a lot. A lot of confidence in this guy. <laughs> But every other tree fell exactly the way it's supposed to, all right? So, but the point is, wherever the tree falls, what's the conclusion? That's where it is. Now, what are you going to do about it? Nothing. So, I couldn't yell at the guy and say, what are you doing? Because that's where, now we have to deal with it. And you just don't know what's going to happen. So... He who watches the wind will not sow, and he who looks at the cloud will not reap. Now, what's he saying? Yeah, that's going to come up. What ifs. Yeah. Now, a lot of people, man, everything's got to be perfect before I act. Everything's, you know, all the stars got to be aligned. Everything's got to be right because 
I don't know if it's going to rain, so I don't want to sow my seed. I want to sow it right before the rain so it'll, it'll cause it to germinate, all right? So the guy that keeps watching the wind, I don't think he's ready. He's not going to get out there and do what he's supposed to do because he's trying to be a prognogus, progress, no, not procrastinator, he's a prognogus, prognosticator, that's close. Man, that was a hard word this morning. Okay, that's true, too. But <clears throat> let me just ask this for uh, young people. Is there ever a right time to have children? <laughs> What's that? There could be a wrong time, but is there ever a perfect time where you're making enough money and you're settled, you've been along enough and you got the right house? Is there ever a right time? You'll never have kids, all right? Is there never, is there the right time to start spending times with your kids? You know, it's taking... Yeah, every day is the right time. Is the right time to start a business? Ever the perfect time? Excuse me, that's what I'm trying to say. The perfect time. No, will there always be challenges and obstacles? Uh, can you make money in recessions? Yes. Yeah, sometimes it's the best time, especially in real estate. It's a great opportunity to you know to get ahead. Uh, can you make money in bull markets? Yes, but is there always challenges in, you know, to any climate you're in? And the guy that's went, I want a perfect, I want a surety, I want just 100%. They're not going to do anything, are they? And that's what he's trying to suggest here. Yes. A person with the one talent. Yeah, he was scared. He was going to lose it all, so he didn't do anything. All right? So what happens is going to happen, and what control do you have over it? None. Now, are there some general rules you can understand and base your life on? Yes, the sun will rise. It has every year, right? Someday it won't, and that'll be the end, so it won't matter what your plans are. Rains do come. The summer will come. It'll be dry. Now, are there years where there's droughts? Yes, but generally you have to just go with the general principles, right? And that's what, what he's suggesting here. So seize the opportunity. Of course, that Robin Williams movie, what was it called? Dead Poets Society. And what was the big catchphrase? Carpe diem. Seize the day. Or seize the moment. Seize the opportunity. Don't let it slip you by. So here it is. Understand the general rules. You know what I'm saying? The general rules? Like... Uh, What's the uh, principle when it comes to uh, the interest rate, uh, how many years your, uh, your uh, balance will double? Do you know what that is? It's the uh, interest rate divided, I don't remember what it is right now. Understand the rules, okay? So that's why I'm not good on finance, all right? You'll never know something for certain, is that true? And make sure that you stop playing the what-if game. Now, what's the what-if game? What if this happens? What if the economy goes bad? What if it doesn't rain this year? What if the real estate market goes down? What if that person ends up paralyzed, right? They don't do anything. Sometimes Anna and I play this game. She says, well, what if? I said, yeah, what if I break my leg tomorrow? Well, I might, you know, but... Um, anything could happen, right? But generally, they don't happen. And if you allow the what if to stop you from doing it, you won't do anything. Isn't that generally true? And that's what he's saying. Don't get caught up in that game. We call that uh, this paralysis of analysis. Have you ever heard that phrase? That I got to analyze everything, and when everything's perfect, then I'll act. Well, that person's just not going to act. He's not going to do anything. No risk, no reward. The what if game, you can play that to your point of having a plan B or a plan C. Sure, you can have. That's right, you can have backups. You know, is there any perfect person to marry? Be careful here. Besides Anne, no, I guess. Is there any 
perfect assurance your marriage is going to work out? Do you know for certain? No. But if you had to have a 100% guarantee that you're going to be happy for the rest of your life, who would get married? Nobody. Is there a risk involved in getting married? Yes. Is there a risk having children? Yes. Have you ever had buyer's remorse when you bought a new car? Man, I don't know if you should have bought this one. Is there any guarantee that you're not going to get a lemon? No. So just don't buy a car at all because there's what if. No, you just buy it. If it turns out to be a lemon, well, it's just your bad luck. Just keep going on, right? But this stops a lot of people, doesn't it? So the only real regret that you're going to have when it's all said and done is looking back and I didn't do something. This opportunity came and I didn't take advantage of it. This opportunity over here, I could have done this, had a great part, and I was just scared, and so I didn't do anything. And how many doors God opened to us and opportunities in life, and I just was scared or fearful, so I just didn't step through them. And say, well, I'm just not a, a risk taker. It's not about being a risk taker. It's about willing to live life because it's short, and you don't know what's going to happen. And then the tree, when it falls, that's where it falls. That's the only thing you can count on. What happens is going to happen. Just go with the general rules, right? Does that make sense? And Paul learned, Paul, Solomon learned this through a lot of wisdom, observing others and his own uh, mistakes, okay? So he says in verse 4 then, uh, 5, Just as you do not know the path of the wind and how bones are formed in the womb of the pregnant woman, you do not know the activity of God, who makes all things. It's interesting what he pulls upon as his illustration. First, the wind. Do you know where the wind's going to blow from and blow to? You know, that's one science they don't, can't predict with accuracy because there's too many variables. So they can do a couple days out, but can they do it perfectly 10 days out? No. You know, it's all thrown them curveballs. And the wind can come from the north, it can come from the west, usually it does here, but it can come from the south and it's warmer. You just don't know what's going to happen. So you start a fire and burning some trash, it's going to blow that way, and as soon as you start it, it blows right into your house. Like, if I would have known that, I would never have started the fire, right? So uh, you don't know. Then he goes <coughs> to the baby formed in the womb. I think this is fascinating because... One baby starts, all of us started out as one cell, right? And it's fertilizing, and then it became what? Two cells, four cells, eight cells. But initially, when you look at all the cells, what do they all look like? Exactly alike. 16, 32, 64, they keep doubling, doubling, doubling. But pretty soon, something happens, and because of God-designed order in your DNA and your RNA and all that. It just says, cell, you go down there and become a big toe, the, the bone down there. Now, how does it do that? How does it know to become a big toe? And then you, you go down there and become, you know, the femur, and you go there and become a rib. And then how does it become a rib? You know, science doesn't know that still. They understand some of the processes, but they, they're just still baffled how it happens. And Solomon was aware of this even in his day. It says, you can't explain something that happens millions of times in the world, billions of times. Babies are born, aren't they? And no one can understand it. And he says, the same way, you don't know what God's doing. So what do you think the lesson is here? What do you think the lesson is? If you look at the verse, you think about this, over, this principle we're talking about, Yes? All right, that'd be good. Don't second guess God. How else could we say that? I was just going to say, the only one that you can count on is God. The only one you can count on, but you don't know what he's doing. But you just know what he does. So trust him, all right? I was going to say, he may have plans for you that you don't know about. All right, but well, so I'm not going to do anything. Yes? Okay, it could be that. Let me just say this. You let God be God, right? He's in charge. And if he wants to bring a drought, that's his business. You'll deal with it then. But what do you do this spring? 
You plant your seeds as though it's going to rain, right? Because you don't know what God is going to do, if he's going to bring the winds to blow in the rains or not. You don't know how bones are formed. That's his business. Let God be God. You just do your job. And that seize the opportunity. Throw your bread on the waters. Invest. You know, take uh, advantage of the opportunities you come way, whatever they are, and just to see how it turns out. Because generally what? Generally. If you sow, you'll reap. No matter what area it's in. It's not just agriculture. It's all areas of life. Generally, that's the rule. Yes. Don't put God in a box. And that's a good way to call this too. And, but it's like, what's insider tr- uh, information when it comes to the stock market? Somebody inside a company sharing secrets. All right. So we're going to split. Amazon stock was like $2,000 a share. Is that what it was? And... Uh, Everyone's waiting. Are they going to do a stock split, like three for one, two for one? So that means if you own 100 shares, all of a sudden now you own 200 shares. So when's the time to buy Amazon stock? Before they do a stock split or after? Depends on how much money you have. Yeah, right. (laughs) But if you could do it right before and it splits, even though the stock prices come down, it doesn't come down to, you know, the same ratio. You make money. So who's the only one that knows when Amazon's going to split their stock? Amazon board of directors, CEO, and all that. So if they called uh, Steve up, say, hey, guess what? I got a hot tip. We're going to split all our stock three to one next week. Buy all you can right now. We call that what? Insider Insider trainer. trainer. It gives them a fair advantage. Uh, this uh, unfair advantage over the rest. And so it's a criminal law, and you could be prosecuted. It's a felony. You could be put in jail for it. And we see that's fair. It should be a level playing field. How come we want to know what God's going to do before we do anything? What, we, what are we asking for? Insider information. God, you tell me what you're going to do. Then I'll go ahead and act. You tell me what it's going to be like this year. You're going to tell me if I'm going to have health problems. You tell me what's going to happen, and then I'll decide if I'm going to act or not. Isn't that sometimes how we think? We want to know for certain, and if God doesn't tell us, I'm not going to do anything. Well, there's no faith. There's no trust. And God's not asking. He's not telling us or guarantees he's going to give us any information. That's his business. Let God be God, and you just do what he asks you to do. Yes? He has told us that we're going to die or Jesus is going to come back. There's pretty much only two things you're going to know, and that's been in Ecclesiastes. You're going to die, and that you're going to stand in judgment. These are the only two things you know for certain. Now, everything else are general rules. And so I think that's what he's saying here. You don't know the activity of God who makes all things. You don't know, so don't be frozen by inactivity just because you're not certain and you can't figure it out. So it's interesting. All the Bible's full of this. The Lord is, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell. It's all God's. He's in charge and he doesn't need our permission before he does something. And it's not for us to say, well, God, you didn't tell me it was going to be really a dry or summer or a really wet winter. He didn't have to. He's ultimately in charge. He alone knows the future. The general rules of order generally apply. Is that a general statement? (laughs) Now, one of the general rules is what Paul expresses in Galatians 6. He's applying it spiritually, but it's a physical law. Whatever a man sows, this he'll reap. And from that, we get a lot of little sub-laws or axioms, you know, that if you don't reap today, you finish it. It's impossible. No, if you don't sow today, sorry. (laughs) I'm just making sure. If you don't sow today, go, you finish it now. 
You cannot reap tomorrow. It's impossible. You can't reap what you didn't sow. But the exciting part about it is, if whatever you sow today, you will reap tomorrow. So you sow the seeds of good marriage, will you reap the, the benefits of that later? If you sow the seeds of good economic wisdom, you know, investment, will you reap that? Yes, with exceptions. Those are general rules, because ultimately who's in charge? God, all right? Okay, so... Um, uh, who, whoever could have foresaw that Trump would be president and then whoever could have foresaw that he put embargo on steel, is that affecting the world market? Who would have ever expected the stock market go like it did and then now it's just been crazy? Can anyone tell me what the stock market's going to do next week? It'll go up or down. It'll go up or down. <laughs> Who's the only one that knows? God, Right? He's the only one who knows. So you're saying, should I invest or not invest? Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Scatter your bread across the water, right? All right? Now, trust him. And understand as Christian, he cares for us. Doesn't he? Does he want us to be successful in this life? I, I want you to look at, uh, well, it'll come up here in the next verse. Um, he says, so here's some some application of the first five verses. Just sow your seed in the morning. Don't be idle the evening. Now, what he's not saying that you have to sow, have two sowings, but this is a, a, a figure of speech where he's saying just be industrious all day long. Work. Take advantage of the opportunities you're given and because you don't know which investment's going to pay off. Because where did it all start with? One investment? No, diversify. So plant this field, and then plant this field, and go plant another one if you have an opportunity to it. Because you don't know which one's going to bring the best harvest. And sometimes this acreage will have a big harvest, and sometimes this one will have just a little. And next year it could be what? Flip-flop. You just don't know. And so uh, just be industrious. Uh, <coughs> does that make sense? And the reason some people don't have in life, I'm not talking about just stuff, they don't have happiness, they don't have relationships, they don't have, is because they never have sown. They're waiting for people to come to them, and they're not investing themselves out there. So don't be idle, be busy. Busy having fun in life. Because what did he say the gift of God was in Ecclesiastes? Is to enjoy the fruit of your labor. That's our reward. It's a blessing from God. So be busy trusting God that there will be some fruit and then enjoy it. Okay? And uh, this is a, this one's tough. And uh, I, I, I read a lot of people that put this so what on this paragraph and I had to think about it, but it's right. If things don't work out, when you understand the whole picture of Ecclesiastes, these two words are really the only appropriate answer. Things don't work out. Your investment blew up. The crops didn't grow. Whatever happened, it went wrong. The only two things you can say is, so what? Is it the end of your life? No. Can you recover? Yes. Is there going to be other opportunities? Yes. And so, so what? The new car you bought's a lemon. Are you going to let that ruin the rest of your life? Because, oh, poor me. Life is just always miserable for me. He's saying, you don't know what's going to happen. God's in charge. It, in charge. And when things don't work out, so what? Just what? Move on. To the next thing, in. Okay. <laughs> yeah, what are you going to do next? Now what are you going to sow? That's good. All right. Solomon also covers this in chapter 9. He says, time and chance happen all. Yeah, that's right. There's no guarantees. Yes. Well, I was going to say, if we go back, if you diversify, if one of those fails, so what? That's right. You got the others. That's right. So how many friends should you have? 
as many as you can. So if one fails you and stabs you in the back or deserts you, what are you going to say ultimately? Come see, come saw, so what? You know, that's just the way life is. Then you turn to the next one. Yes? Whatever is, is best. David Larson, where is David? His saying is, whatever is, is, until it ain't, and right now it is, so get over it. <laughs> he said that so many times, you know, but it makes sense. Whatever is, is, until it ain't, and right now it is, so get over it. Whatever the is. If it's good, great. If it's bad, so what? It'll change. Yes? When you look at Job, he has no oh. That's when it's hard to say so what, when you're in the, misery, in the middle of your misery, right? It's hard to. That's why Ecclesiastes are these words to live by, this wisdom. So you take back, you step back from your misery and, and just try to get a bigger perspective. This soon too will pass, right? So what? It's not as bad as others. Some have had it worse, but I'm going to die anyway, even if it's the worst one in the world. So what? Really? Isn't that true? If I get to heaven and I look back, and so what? The, the Seahawks didn't win the Super Bowl twice. So what, right? So what? My house burnt down. I lost everything. All my photographs, all my memories. So what? You say, well, how could you say that? So insensitive. Well, I never see anyone take their memory box to heaven. None of them, no one does, do they? We all leave it behind anyway. So what? And then if it doesn't work out, What's the answer? Just go do something else. That's where Ann said, S-O-W. What are you going to sow next or sow what? All right? So uh, reading out of the, off the screen, but we're now in verse 7, if you're following in the text. The light is pleasant and is good for the eyes to see the sun. Indeed, if a man should live many years, let him rejoice in them all. And let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. Everything that has come will be futility. Okay, now the underlying principle, the bottom line is when it's all said and done, what is it? It's all vanity. So if you understand that, you're not going to put all your hope, all your aspirations, all your purpose and your meaning for existence in one activity or one basket. Because if you do that, you're going to be severely disappointed. Because when you put it all in there, when it's all said and done, like, well, that was vain. Remember that. And so, when it's sunny, those are good days. Now, yesterday was a beautiful day, wasn't it? And when you're coming out of the winter, aren't those first spring days where it's warm and flowers are coming, except for your allergies, I get that. But aren't they, isn't that pleasant? So what's he saying? There are those pleasant years and days in your life. Enjoy them. Because guess what's coming? The days of darkness. Will they come in everybody's life? And do they come in a set order, like so many good days and so many bad days? Or do they come intermittently sometime? There's no guarantee when they come. It's interesting. Surveys show that a lot of seniors have lived the most fulfilled life of all age groups. There's more contentment and joy in their life. Why is that? And it's true, it's like they reinvest themselves in other things. There's a wisdom they have, and they're not chasing things like they used to, and they enjoy the days of light because they know life is fleeting. They've been through enough darkness. They really enjoy those days of light. They've learned some of these lessons. So, yes. Yeah, you get to do that as well. That's right. So, let them remember the days of darkness, because they're going to happen. All right? So he goes on. And he says, here it is. Rejoice, young men. Now, I don't know where young starts, and I don't know where it ends. I think young is a disposition of the mind, largely. Isn't it? I know some people in their 50s and 60s, they have as much youthful uh, energy and excitement as a 20-year-old. And you know, some 20, 30-year-olds have already given up on life. They're very old, emotionally and spiritually, right? So I'm not the one to say it, but what he's saying here is, young man, 
during your childhood, let your heart be pleasant. That's so important. Rejoice. Life is so short. There are going to be days of darkness. Enjoy the good days while you have them. Probably some of the best days of your life are is in childhood. What responsibilities generally do you have, especially in America? Do you have to go to work and earn a living and pay for the whole family? Generally, no. You have to go to school and study, but what can you do with the rest of your time? Whatever you want. Play. Have fun. Enjoy life. Spring break, you go skiing. You don't have to worry about, you know, nine to five every day. And that's so fleeting. But what do uh, middle schoolers want to do? They can't wait till they get what? Out of middle school into high school. Then there'll be something, then life will be happy. When you're high school, what can, what's the only thing you wait for? Graduation. When you graduation, what do you wait for? A good job, maybe college, maybe getting, then I'll be happy if I get married. Then when you get married, what are you waiting for? If I have children, then life will be complete. And when you have children, what are you waiting for? Yeah, for those children to leave, <laughs> yeah, some sleep. And when they leave, I'll finally be happy to do what I want to do again. You're yearning for that child again all over. But then, yeah, grandchildren, they're always looking for the next era, which would be better than that. And Solomon says, stop it. Stop it. Enjoy the day. Because it's the best day of your life, because it's the only day of your life right now. You can't relive the past. Be pleasant. Oh, ouch. Ooh. So many people are not pleasant. They got a chip on their shoulder. They're ornery. They're unhappy. They feel like life has passed them by. They're just not pleasant people. They can be grumpy. Everything irritates them. It's because like they feel like the world owes them, but generally they just haven't followed these rules of wisdom to live by. They haven't seized the opportunity. They haven't cast their bread on the waters. They're paralyzed by analysis. They're afraid to do anything, so they wonder why they haven't reaped anything. And so they're not pleasant people. This is the best words he could give. Rejoice, be happy, and be pleasant. Yes. Yeah, as well. And can be idle, she said, become an idol. I mm -hmm. heard um, people calling in that were talking about Brother Trump's flavored stuff, and they said they hated working Sundays because the Christians were the worst. <laughs> Oh, really? Well, and that goes with this, you know, God's disposition or attitude towards complainers. He just says, what? After all I've done for you and what I, yeah. Then here it is. Follow the impulse of your heart and the desires of your eyes. Wow, and I thought, you know, the only thing we have are the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. These just get people in trouble. Why would he say follow the impulses of your heart? And the desires of your eyes. Look real quickly, because we don't have a lot of time. Psalms 37. I just put up the first verse, but you need to see the verses before it and after it. It's a great psalm. First of all, verse 1. Don't fret because of evildoers. Don't be envious towards wrongdoers. Because they're going to wither quickly like the grass and the, fade like the green. God's general rules of justice are going to apply but here it is, verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Then he says, delight yourselves in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Isn't that what Solomon's saying? But then he follows through. He says in verse 5, commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him. And he will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as light as your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Don't fret because of him who prospers in his way. Because the man who carries out wickedness schemes. Cease from anger. Forsake wrath. Don't fret. It only leads to evil doing. For the evildoers will be cut off. But those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. So right in the middle 
of, uh, on the bookends of either side where he says, God's going to carry out the desires of your heart. What does he say on both sides? Be faithful. Commit yourself to the Lord. So we have to understand when Solomon's saying, follow the impulses of your heart, the desire of your eyes, is he saying just eat drunk, be uh, wild, and just do whatever you want? Exactly. But if you want to be an astronaut, be an astronaut. Is that what he's saying? If you want to get married and have 16 children, don't let anyone tell you no. That's stupid. You shouldn't do it. Follow the impulses and the desires of your heart because you only live life once. And if you don't follow them, the biggest regret you'll have is saying, no, I didn't follow the, uh, take advantage of opportunities given me. And we look back and they come, don't they? Opportunities usually only present themselves once in life. And if you say no to them, some of those will never present themselves again. Now, is he saying being wild and crazy? No. But if you want to become a doctor, be a doctor. If you want to be a logger, be a logger. If that's going to make you happy. If you want to be a farm, farm. If you want to travel, what should you do? Travel, because there'll come a day you can't travel. You won't be able to. Do whatever God opens doors for you, but he's not saying being crazy. Just take advantage of opportunities you've given you. But remember what? God's going to bring you into judgment for all these things. That's the following statement. Just be wise. Okay, one more verse and we're done. So, remove grief and anger from your heart. Isn't that interesting? He starts with sowing your seed, your bread upon the water, taking advantage of opportunities. Don't get it paralyzed by analysis. Just, just do something. And he ends with, put away anger and grief from your heart. I guess maybe the connection is people that are bitter older folks are the ones that they feel like life has passed them by. And life didn't give them what they deserved. And the real answer is, though, why? If we understand this chapter, why are they angry and bitter? And why did life pass them by? They didn't do anything. They just sat around and waited for it to come to them. They're like, oh, life owed them. They didn't take advantage of the opportunities. They didn't seize the moment. They didn't follow the impulses of their heart. And so they're bitter people. They're sad. They're angry people. He said, put it away. Put away pain from your body because childhood and the prime of life are fleeting. Don't the days just go by? Look at this lady and look at her eyes now. That's going to be all of you looking in the mirror. Some of you right now, I know. <laughs> but that's going to be used very soon, right? So when it's all said and done, here's what he says. Um, remember your creator in the days of your youth. We'll pick that up, Lord willing, next week. All right, thank you very much. Yep.